Okay, pro football fans, get ready for the incredible. Brace yourself for the preposterous, the unbelievable. Be prepared to witness the unexpected. Ay, caramba, my nose! Join us on a fascinating journey as we meet and observe the wild, weird, and wacky of the pro football world. You'll see astounding sights that will shock and amaze, as brought to you by our crew of award-winning cameramen. Yes, it's time once again for Pro, Pro Football Believe, Believe it, it or else. else. Believe it or else, shocking as it may seem, today's athlete may not be in shape. Results from the recently released Braunschweiger report indicate subdued players with a more laid-back style. Big salaries may be swelling a few heads. Some players demand adulation for doing almost nothing. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And still others insist on chauffeured limo service to and from the locker room. Such data disturbed most NFL coaches, and so a bold and innovative fitness program was introduced around the league. The program applied principles from the world's foremost therapists. Modern dance fundamentals were also incorporated. And step and step and turn and step and open your toes, Kevin. Watch your back. The program also provided assistance for those who appeared troubled or confused. Some of the more unusual cases included an advanced state of schizophrenia. One man continued to play football even though the game had been over for three hours. Such problems were dealt with by enlisting the aid of counselors who listened attentively to each player. Finally, the effects of this daring approach began to materialize. Awfully decent, you old chap. No one seemed particularly pleased with the results. Undaunted, the players are now trying a new training method they feel certain will work. Believe it or else, player moonlights as halftime entertainer. Believe it or else, middle-aged stadium band conductor plans second career as football star. Believe it or else, referees, no longer content just to announce penalties over PA, reveal they will open limited engagement at Copacabana next summer. If one of those bottles should happen to fall, 98 bottles of beer on the wall, 98 bottles of beer on the wall. Indeed, the entertainment bug has really bit around the NFL, thanks in part to the hard-working cheerleaders who have earned so much acclaim. It is a glamorous life, instant celebrity status, nationwide exposure, 
and a chance to mingle with the upper crust of society. But because it looks like so much fun, there are those who might think that anyone could be an NFL cheerleader. Nothing could be further from the truth. The girls must be willing to work in hostile climates, allow themselves to be lacquered for promotional tours, dance with season ticket holders at booster club outings, and occasionally date some of the homelier players. So to all who may be considering cheerleading as a lifelong occupation, take note. Despite the outer glamour, football cheerleading isn't for everyone. The incredible story of a haunted stadium. The, the football bill horror. It started with the wind. Sudden, mysterious, unexplained. Roaring winds that played havoc with all who entered the stadium's gates. Soon the winds died down, but then the football seemed to take on a life of its own. Whatever force possessed the ball soon had the players themselves in its evil grasp. The fans were in shock. The athletes, battered and bruised, did not have a clue. So from around the world, experts of the supernatural were summoned to the scene to study the matter. And yet still, the football bill horror remained. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. To this day, no one has ever unlocked the secret of the Footballville horror. And those who have tried have never been heard from again. Now for all the late-breaking stories, here's the Believe It or Else Newswire. Incredible as it may seem, more and more creatures have been appearing at football games. Their union, the powerful AFL, or Animal Federation of Labor, has enacted right-to-work laws that give them equal time on Sunday. But although their presence has had little impact on the game, they have made their mark in one significant area. Hey, let me see your feet. Uh, you're okay. Next. Okay, you're clean. Okay, okay. Next. Believe it or else, in their continuing quest to gain American goods, the oil-producing nations have purchased several football franchises and given them a Middle East flavor. OPEC also announced that advisors will be on hand at the games to supervise operations and report directly to the chic ownership. Their first recommendation, raise beer prices $2 a barrel. No, you numbskull, three burgers with fries, three of them. Finally, after years of antiquated communication systems, teams have installed phone units. But already some players are abusing this privilege. Hey, baby. I told you never to call me here. Of course I love you. No, no, I won't forget. A quarter milk, a loaf of bread, and some m and m with peanuts. Okay, I got it. I'm sorry, but you have dialed a wrong exchange. Please hang up and try again. This just in to the Believe It or Else newsroom. Torrential rains have engulfed several football stadiums. 
Record-setting precipitation, particularly in tropical areas, has caused inordinate problems to the fans and players. One note of caution, the unusual weather has caused many plants to grow rapidly in unexpected places. So be on the lookout. Uh -oh. Believe it or else, losing teams plagued with bad luck, no draft choices and little hope have turned to a higher authority. Over 80,000 cheering fans turned out for the first ever Pro Football Revival meeting last week. Brothers and sisters, the path of righteousness leads to the end zone. Yay, verily, football showed me the light. These inspired fans have caught the spirit. Yet another astonishing but true story from the annals of Pro Football's Believe It or Else.
The NFL News Parade is on the air. New York City. Here, Commissioner Pete Rozelle, monarch of pro football, makes a startling announcement. NFL to adopt the metric standard of weights and measures. Observers view Switch as a patriotic gesture, a move endorsed by world leaders. And so, from snow-capped peaks to desert sands, in every NFL stadium, the metric system becomes the law of the land. A happy Pete Rozelle points with pride to the system's early success. But on other fronts, doubts begin to emerge. Players and fans confused. Headaches. Newly changed field surfaces adjusted to metric standards. Too large for present stadium confines. And so all stadiums are completely remodeled to conform to new regulations. Cost, no man can say. Players no longer measured in feet or pounds. Vendors mourn loss of foot-long hot dog. Sports writers say goodbye to hallowed cliches like three yards and a cloud of dust, and it's a game of inches. Referees now mark off penalties and infractions in centimeters. Confusion pervades. Players and coaches launch angry tirades. So the league calls in experts to educate the public. I'm going to answer all your questions, so don't worry about a thing. <clears throat> well, let's take a look at the rule book. Here is the old book, and here is the newly updated metric copy. Well, it, it is a bit more detailed, isn't it? Well, that's not the only change. Nowadays, referees are using these things to uh, compute the yardage. I guess it is a little ridiculous, isn't it? And the record book. Well, <laughs> you can just throw this thing right out the window. O.J. Simpson's 2,003 yards. Now, that is 1,832.476 meters. Well, it kind of takes the romance out of it, don't you think? Now, unruly fans threaten to revolt. Officials fear for their safety. The state militia armed and ready for the worst. And so, the commissioner acts once more, calling for the one measure that will bring peace. Jubilation sweeps through the player ranks. Pandemonium sweeps the nation. The Hundred Yard War is home to stay. Hello, I'm Jim Turner, field goal kicker of the Denver Broncos, and I'd like to clear up some misconceptions about kickers in general. All too often, this position has been underrated, and you re really, folks, these guys are important to their teams. I mean, have you ever seen a game start without a kickoff? Kickoffs, to me, are the most exciting part of any game because you never know when the return men, the great athletes that they are, will bring one back all the way. Kicker's life is a lonely one. We're isolated from the team until the toughest situations arise. Only then do we get to race onto the field to contribute our share. You can almost feel the clock ticking and every eye glued to you. Most kickers love this pressure because we're a breed of men who thrive on tension and there's nothing that feels better than sharing the glory of a victory after ramming one home.
course, it's these last second triumphs that endure us to the fans, and I know some kickers who even have their own fan clubs. I think the fan clubs are great. They make the kickers feel right at home because, as you know, a lot of the kickers are foreign soccer-style booters and can't even speak English. Jetzt möchte ich den einen von der Zeitung hören, der gesagt hat, ich kann nicht mehr schießen als 40. <laughs> the one man every kicker depends on is his holder. Combined with the kicker's foot, the holder's great hands complete an excellent example of precision teamwork. Of course, should trouble arise, there is always an alternative because with most teams, the holder is also the best passer. The main thing to watch on a field goal attempt is the perfect timing between kicker and holder. It's this timing that often leads to the game-winning play. Another kicker who's often overlooked is the punter. Every successful punt begins with a nice, crisp, accurate center snap. But even if the center snap is not number high, the punter will have little trouble as they've all got excellent hands. Even should something go wrong at the beginning of a punt, there's little to worry about because these punters are a breed of cool, poised men who always know what to do in any emergency. I hope that what you've seen here has helped you change your mind a little bit about the importance and the abilities of the most special men on the special team, and that's the kickers. And remember, when you see your team out there lining up for a game-winning field goal attempt, more than likely, victory is in the bag. The game is called pro football, but its nickname is Glamour. Glamour in a swirl of balloons, bands, girls, and pageantry. It's Glamour with a capital G, and at its center are the players, the jousting knights of the NFL. But the glory is not shared equally. When most players are introduced, their names set off little more than a flurry of searching in the program. Relatively unknown, these players are greeted by polite applause, mild cheering, or half-hearted indifference, because every eye is searching for the one man they all know. And when he appears, the mild cheers become uproar. For that one man is everyone's hero, the quarterback. The quarterback, idol of small boys. The quarterback, secret romance of young girls. He's dashing and debonair every mother's son. His appearance whips the crowd to a frenzy. He is number one, a breed of man who races out to take the sun-drenched field by storm, for he is none other than Sunday's glorious general. The quarterback is a varied style of man. Some are young mod gods with whips and cannons for arms. They survive on instinct. Others are older, slower, wiser, and they survive by their aged experience and sagacious wisdom. But young or old, they stand on common ground in the center ring. They are glamorized and immortalized. They are the trend weavers, the style setters. For the ones who have proven themselves, the merest appearance inspires respect from all who watch them pass. They are adored by the fans who live to merely touch the hem of their jerseys. They are revered and honored by their teammates.
When the general takes the field, everyone knows it's his game, and he's in charge right from the moment of the opening snap. The quarterback's ball handling is nothing short of phenomenal. Pure wizardry. It's in the huddle that he becomes true master. Each play plotted in concise patterns. Every soldier knowing his exact assignment. A quarterback's mind and body work as one flawless in their perfection. His hands are flashing quick nimbleness. His legs are smoothly pumping precision pistons. But his overriding talent is his superb rapport with his receivers. They're timing a 19-jewel Swiss movement. The great quarterbacks will always hit the open man. Under pressure, their accuracy is uncanny. Most signal callers have developed a poised, relaxed throwing style. When the quarterback drops back, there is always the threat of an instant score. However, not everyone is enamored with these courageous field generals. There are some players who are not his friends, and he tries to fool these miscreants with a vast repertoire of arcane tricks, such as drawing them off sides. Sometimes the baddies resent it. And sooner or later, the general finds that he'll have to learn to live with an occasional nudge or two. Weather is another enemy with which our hero easily copes. Perhaps the greatest asset of any quarterback is that no matter what the situation, he manages to survive with his dignity unruffled. He doesn't get hung up on little things. As team leader, he must know when to let up. He must know the precise moment when to give his mates time to relax. It is in his psyche to know when to use the forward pass and when to go with something a little trickier. He must know when to use the curl pattern and when to go to the post. The quarterback, the man who keeps the machine moving. 
Ever alert, the man who provides excitement, dazzle, sunburst to the game. He keeps the fan on the edge of his seat. For he is truly... Lousy. For he is truly Sunday's glorious general. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the NFL Symphony. The world's foremost purveyors of gridiron art have been assembled to perform their unique disciplines for your edification and cultural refinement. They will be accompanied by the NFL Symphony Orchestra under the direction of Maestro Philippe Duquette. This will be an evening of the classics, with just a dash of avant-garde dissonance. You see, the unpredictability of this particular work is what makes it so appealing. No one is quite certain what will happen next, including the performers. Where else can one savor such marvelous modulation, such robust relevé, such elevated échappé, such appalling futilité? These virtuosos are versatile. From classic ballet to comic opera, they fall into many diverse roles, which they handle with aplomb. NFL technique may seem a bit irregular to purists, yet one must admire the enthusiasm with which they present themselves. I beg you not to be overly critical of form, texture, or tone color. Simply relax and delight in the NFL symphony. Every symphony needs a conductor. Someone to set meter, pitch, and cadence. A place to turn in moments of doubt for kind words of reassurance. The snap counts on too, you big dummy. Oh. The quarterback is just such a commander, leading by word and deed. Oops. He is a pathfinder through enemy territory. Whoa! A helmsman around whom the crew rallies. Oh, boy. The calm in a sea of confusion. Help me! He is the quarterback. The man with a plan, as it were. Oh, oh. These precious quarterbacks must be protected by a cast of lesser players, known as offensive linemen or punching bags. These poor devils take a fearful thrashing in the course of their duties, yet they are far from the dumb brutes they appear to be. Subtle, nearly hidden methods of retaliation have been created. A favorite is the five-fingered minuet. It is performed by firmly grasping an opponent, then waltzing about until the play ends, or said opponent starts swinging. Never rehearse? Why, of course they do, madam. And very often they perform just as they rehearse. Wow. Why, this is disgraceful. <gasps> These 
gentlemen are paid enormous salaries to eliminate just such behavior. Madam, I believe they are doing the very best they can. It's sometimes the ball that refuses to cooperate. Catch it! Absurd! Well, the only hope is to continue rehearsals, I suppose. And to think I bet 20 bucks on these turkeys. <gasps> to restore a semblance of order, one in authority must step forward. This is the official, or referee, or blind zebra, or as the players call him, the twit. His primary function is to make absolutely certain that nothing is allowed to interfere with the flow of the performance. Occasionally, one of these unobtrusive gentlemen wishes to send a message. This is cleverly done by throwing a small yellow hanky. Needless to say, performers have the utmost respect for officials and their small yellow hankies. Of course, the servile players are forever quick to retrieve these hankies and return them respectfully to their owners. We are often asked, what does go on in the huddle? Now, for the first time, it can be revealed. Coloraturas of the NFL Opera Company are preparing their voices, applying makeup, and assuming their finest dramatic poses for a performance of the Zone Defense Cantata by the noted Floridian composer Schula. They take the stage before an audience which includes Italian opera critic Dante Parabatti. The first act opens with plots against the evil prince Red Dog. Slaughter right! Split left. Trap block. Quick pitch on two. Later in the first act, ineptitude destroys the army's morale, and each man seeks an excuse for his own imperfections. Oh, <laughs> 
a Now we move to Act 3, as expatriate soldiers attempt to send messages to their worried mothers. Largo the cost and tell Hi, Mom. Number one, number one, number one. Look! Presto me tega que la vita. Hi, Mom. Number one, number one, number one. One! Pe fortunatissimo peperita. La, 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 Hi, Mom! Hi, Mom! Hi, Mom! Hi, Mom! Hi, Mom! Hi, Mom! Abro figro, bravo rismo, abro figro, bravo rismo, a divertona te, fortona te, fortona no ma cara. Hi, Mom! We're number one! Hi, Mom! We're number one! We're number one! We're number one! The handshake is smashing, we all must agree, to demonstrate friendship and group repartee. It all started quite simply, a straightforward grip. Then came variations to show sportsmanship. Now it's out of control in the old NFL. All the outrageous ways to wish someone well. There's soul shakes and high slaps and give me some skin, till one simply can't tell what is out and what's in. It's come to a point, if a new man turns pro, he doesn't know when to shake high or shake low. Say, good show, old chap, and avoid the mishap. Ouch! Hut. Have you ever noticed, class, how like Greek mythology the NFL is? For example, running backs are modern-day Mercuries. Veritable messengers of the gods, as it were. Just as Mercury served those on Mount Olympus, runners are entrusted with the game's most prized possession, the ball, then asked to defend it with their very lives. Why, even the runners' various methods of advancing towards goal can be considered mercurial. That is to say, characterized by rapid and unpredictable changes in style. You may feel I have stretched this analogy, class, but I think not. A running back's task is the same as Mercury's, to carry the mail. The next movement of the symphony blends grace and agility of the backs with raw animal power of the linemen, large, vulgar men, who are usually not allowed out in mixed company. They are all members of the NFL Ballet Ensemble, a bizarre yet finely tuned troupe under the direction of ballet master Pierre Plié. Stretch, stretch, more movement, disciple, my darlings. Monsieur Plié has personally shaped his men for this moment, and as he unwinds on the sideline, they nervously await their cue to begin the beautiful black and blue Danube.
that life as an NFL ballet aficionado has its drawbacks, sorry to say. Because indoor productions are rare, inclement weather can be a bit inconvenient for those with thin blood, and most irritating for one in charge of wardrobe. But worst of all is footing on stage. Classical ballet takes quite a beating, I'm afraid. would never approve. Still, the fellows jolly well give it their best under the circumstances. I think it's bloody disgraceful when some cheeky fans display their ignorance by pelting the poor lads with snowballs all the way to their dressing quarters. For our finale, we take you to stadiums all across this nation, where week after week, capacity crowds are lured by America's greatest game. Here, players and fans have a chance to personally conduct the NFL Symphony.
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so very much. Thank you. I am your narrator, Bruno Parfait, and over there are others who contributed, like special music editing by Jeff Earhart and voices by the Fellowship Road players with Carolyn O'Donnell. No, no, I'm not done yet. Back to the credits. Behind the scenes, we have Dick Dufresne and Art Spieler. <sighs> Associate producer Stanley Leshner spending John Mullen's money. Music department rhythm ace Phil Spieler. Director of photography, Ernie Ernst, and number one son, Howie Neef. In charge of production, Mike Adams and his merry men and ladies, Vicky Denenberg, Doris Abelson, Paul Lerman, John Bell, Ed Dents, Tom Grafe, Bill Gray, Laura Larbar, Hank McKelvey, Jack Newman, Jack Nicholson, Don Paravati, Dave and Kathy Paul, Kenny Smith, and Jay Gerber. Over there is America's editor-in-chief, Bob Ryan, while out front is producer Steve Sable, semi-flamboyant son of the boss, Ed Sable. Big Ed keeps close watch on his son, and also the kid from Utah who wrote and directed the NFL Symphony. That's Phil Tuckett. And need I even mention what made it all possible?